tells us. Good evening. <clears throat> Tonight I have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, who has quite the accomplished hobby rocketry career and found some spare time to do a few other important things in his life. I'll let you read about all of John's accomplishments throughout his career and his bio. I want to tell you about the John Langford I know. John and I were introduced early in my association with rocketry, and the friendship has grown since then. When I began rocketry, I recall numerous interactions with John and family at Novar and Naram events throughout the years. I also remember John has always supported the NAR in our local Novar section. There was a time that he allowed us to um, use the Aurora facility to repaint our Novar trailer. I can tell you firsthand that a belt sander does an awesome job at stripping that old orange paint from a plywood trailer. And somehow belt sanders also did an excellent job of applying a coat of orange dust throughout the Aurora facility. I'm sure there are places where the dust can still be found. And what was John's reaction to this? He said, eh, don't worry about it. And the newly painted trailer looks great. John helped me when we first started the International Rocket Tube Contest by serving as a judge for several years. John was awesome working with the students. John has led the support of the US team for the World Space Modeling Championships for as long as I can remember. He is respected in the FAI community as a leader and innovator. John is also willing to share the experience of leading a US team. I still remember that day when John asked me to lunch at an air show. Great lunch in the Boeing Chalet, met a few of his colleagues, and then the ask. The US team needed a manager for the World Championships in Poland. Trip did all the pre-work, so the only thing left was to be in charge once the team hit the ground in Poland. It'll be easy, John said. After all, Trip is so organized that you only have to get up on the podium with the winning teams. Somehow the little things that were missing from his description of the duties um, consisted of stuff like, oh, a missing team bus and the need to find an alternative way to get the whole team to, and a truckload of luggage to the event hotel. And then it was a piece of cake dealing with the missing five rooms at the hotel and the, the need to rearrange all the rooming assignments. I also didn't know that being the team manager required expert negotiating skills. You know, for when I had to get over a thousand euros back from the organizers who conveniently only spoke Polish. I did, however, get the money. But seriously, so John, um, it is the honor, my honor to um, introduce you as former CEO of Aurora Flight Sciences, an executive at Boeing, and now the founder and CEO of Electra. John is a, a very innovative thinker. Ask him sometimes about air taxis. Great presentation, John. And with the many accomplishments and, and leadership roles that John has made throughout his career, he found time to buy this little hobby rocket company with his family. John's talk tonight is building back better in Penrose, making S's better again. I'm anxious to hear what he has to say. So it's my honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. John Langford. John, thank you. Well, thank you very, very much, John. I, I really appreciate that. And and it, it it was pretty accurate description. I mean, at least you didn't have to bail anybody out of the hospital or anybody out of jail, <laughs> which both of which have happened <laughs> on those things before. So uh so Duffy and and uh, and Matt Steele's talk today uh, sort of scratched the surface, shall we say, of some of the adventures that the teams have had over the years. But thank you very much, uh, John, for that introduction, and and thank you, Ed and Todd, for all of the work that you guys have done pulling this together. What uh, what I wanted to try to do in the next uh, few minutes is to talk a little bit about uh, what's going on over at Estes, and give some of the backstory of sort of what we're thinking what we're trying to accomplish, uh, sort of where we're coming from and where we're trying to, to go in that. As, uh, as John mentioned, I, uh, I really got into, uh, into this in, uh, sorry, just one second as we get the, okay, good, the chart's running here. So, um, you know, this is Penrose, Colorado on the, on the screen. Uh, I, I imagine many people in this audience have, have been there uh, it is still the model rocket capital of the world, a uh, title it's held for something like 70 years. This is the Estes campus. It's about 300 acres uh, in the shadow there of Pikes Peak in the background. 
and you can see in this campus the uh, the engine making uh, uh, sheds off on the uh, sort of the left side of the Estes campus, sort of the iconic headquarters building in the uh, in the foreground there, and then in the warehouses which handle the the uh, both assembly and and shipping operations um, off on the uh, on the right side. And there's still quite a bit of land out here, which, as we'll we'll talk about later in the presentation, um, features into some of the thoughts that we have uh, have going going ahead. That's Route 50, by the way, in the in the uh, in the foreground, which uh, um, uh, you know goes across the country. Literally, you could drive from our current house in in uh, Virginia drive down the street, hang a right on Route 50 and, and drive for five days and drive right by the Estes plant. So I haven't done that yet, but I keep threatening to. My journey to Penrose is really uh, <laughs> covers my entire uh, time in the, in the hobby. My first visit there was back in 1968. That's me standing on a, on a fence post that uh, is actually still there. The, the, the headquarters building was uh, just being finished. That's me also uh, with my younger brother uh, expressing his displeasure at how cold it is, but with a, a slightly modified Saturn 1B there pr that we're preparing to launch. And um, as you all know, the, the company was started in 1958 by Vern and Glita Estes, whose story I think is well known to, uh, to, to this audience and who had the company until about 1970 or so. Estes has actually changed hands five times over the years, and that progression uh, of owners is an important part of the story of how we got to where we are today. Uh, you know, Vern and Glita sold it to Damon, which was a science education company headquartered in Massachusetts in about 1970, and Damon still holds the record of the longest in possession of the uh, of, of Estes. Um, then there was a series of, of sort of two private equity firms, TCW, um, which has some ties over into uh, Barry Tunick and Prairie Capital, who ran the company during the early part of, of this century. And then in about uh, 2009 or 2010, Hobbyco uh, purchased it. And Hobbyco, of course, was a, a um, ambitious, hobby distributor, uh, primarily model airplanes, but but all sorts of things. They had at several plastic model companies. Um, hobby Co., uh, you know, each time it's changed hands, I think we in the hobby have thought this this will be good. This will be a good thing uh, for, uh, for for the for the hobby, for the business that Damon seemed like a really good choice uh, on Vernon Glita's part to sell to. Um, I think all, most of us had less visibility into what was going on when TCW and then Prairie Capital came in. But when Hobbyco came in, I think we all were pretty positive about that. I remember being excited that this would be good for Estes. And for a couple of years, it was. The first couple of years under Hobbyco leadership, it was the, the you could see Estes come, kind of coming back into the into the hobby and operating less as a toy company, which is really the way the private equity firms had, uh, had, had viewed it. Um, unfortunately, Hobbyco was overextended themselves and ran into some serious financial troubles starting in about 2013 or so. Um, essentially, they ran up against uh, a buzzsaw called Amazon and a buzzsaw called DJI. They bet heavily on the commercial drone business and that turned out to be a mistake. And by 2017, they were in serious financial trouble. Um, the, uh, the Estes operation was being used primarily as a generator for cash. They were, they were pulling every, um, all the money out of it that they could uh, with, with no uh, maintenance or investment of any, of any sort. And they ended up in a bankruptcy uh, proceeding in, in the spring of, uh, of 2018, which is how we came into this. This, this immediate story really starts in about uh, the NARUM of 2017, I remember and Trip Barber, and we were sort of despairing what would happen if Estes went away because the company had been greatly weakened by, uh, by the decline under, under Hobbyco, and we were afraid that one more uh, abusive owner would probably, that would be a huge loss for the hobby. And 
Long story short, we ended up um, buying it at, that bank, at a bankruptcy auction in Delaware in March of 2018. And on April 12th uh, of 2018, found ourselves uh, um, in charge there. And this story would not have been possible without the group that's shown on the right there. And uh, I'll just run quickly through that. That's the advisory board that, that we put in place, but all of them have played essential roles. The first is Mallory Langford, who you'll hear a lot more about in a minute. Me, uh, Vern, who, who um, needs no introduction, but I, I can't say enough about how important he has been in this transition, uh, has been by our side the whole way. Uh, Mary Roberts. Mary Roberts is an absolute unsung hero for the whole hobby. I know many of you know her in her various roles in her uh, very distinguished career at Estes, but she played an important, really vital role in this transition of helping us navigate the permitting process that allowed us to pull the company out of bankruptcy, transfer all the important permits in sort of record time, uh, and get it back and running again. Because without those permits, you couldn't produce and without and without producing, you can't ship and without shipping, there's no income and, and uh, cash is blood. So the company would, would not have made it without uh, Mary Roberts' active role uh, in ensuring its, its survival. We all owe her a great debt. Next is Ellis, uh, who is known to many of you from his rocket career. Uh, you'll hear more about that uh, in a minute. Bill Stein, who again needs no introduction, uh, part of the real family, the first family dynasty of, of model rocketry. Uh, the Stein family and Bill uh, came on board shortly after we took over and has played an essential role in the, in the, in the revitalization. And of course, you heard from Bill last night. And then uh, Trip Barber, who's been a, a, a critical advisor throughout this. And then Fritz Langford, who's also on the, the, uh, the advisory board of, of, of the operation. So an, an important question is, why, why did we do this? <laughs> um, it, uh, it, the answer is pretty simple. Um, it's because I truly believe that, that rocketry is an essential part of the STEM education enterprise that that what we have seen just over and over again is that it really is the educational space age hobby the tagline that that Vern and Glita came up with back in the in the 1960s um, it's now on sort of the fourth generation of rocketeers and the hobby has played the same role for each generation the generations have changed as you can see in these pictures you know this is not your grandfather's hobby of model rocketry. Um, the, the, it's much more diverse, it's much more vibrant, um, but it, it, uh, it still plays the same fundamental role of giving kids hands-on learning in the science and education process. If you saw Trip Barber's talk earlier about TARC, that's what we're talking about. Experimentation, doing calculations, then building stuff, flying it, measuring it, having all of the, the challenges and failures and learning experiences that go with that. And, you know, a big part of what we're talking about is exactly what, what Andrew and Jenna were talking about last night in their keynote uh, opening address. How do we make the hobby uh, broader, uh, more diverse, more inclusive? You know, 51% of the population is, uh, is female, is women. Um, in the workforce, that number is like 48%. In the aerospace industry, it's like 15%. And, and, and that number has been, um, is much higher today than it was in the, uh, in the 60s. But it has been stubbornly stuck around that sort of 15, 16, 18% number for uh, the last 20 years or so. And so how how we, we break that out to drive it to where the percentage of, of, uh, of women in engineering is, you know, 40 to 60 percent is really the fundamental challenge uh, that, that, that I think we're addressing. And, and obviously, I don't mean to make it sound like it's just women. It's a, to diversify the whole workforce. But, uh, but those numbers are just so striking. We're making 
really great progress. But as, as Andrew and Jenna talked about last night, we have a long way to go and a lot to learn in, in how we do that. When we took over Estes, we, we put together and we were like, you know, where's the bathroom here kind of thing. It, it was, we, we really did not have a well-developed plan. We were first, how do we get things back to where we can ship product? Um, and there was a great team in place at Estes who uh, a, a very loyal, very dedicated workforce who, who, uh, uh, who knew how to do that and to help us. And as I mentioned, Mary Roberts was essential to that. And we set up the still um, an employee there. She, her vow was to sort of like the Supreme Court justice. She was going to hang on until the new administration came in. And she did. She, she, she got Estes through the transition before she, uh, before she retired. Um, but over that first year or so, we put together the first of a series of five-year plans. And I wanted to kind of walk you through what our, what our goals in that were. The first was to make the company a self-sustained uh, self-contained, self-supporting business again. Um, the second was to create a strong STEM education focus. The third goal was to make it a rocket company again. You know, the, some of the previous owners had clearly viewed it as a toy company and had treated it as such. And the capability to develop rocket motors had atrophied um, and, and uh, over, over the years, and we wanted to, to rebuild that. We also wanted to expand into the professional aerospace because that's kind of that's the world I kind of have have come from, and I, I see huge opportunities there. This professional aerospace um, sees operations like Estes as workforce development, right? What we provide to uh, the aerospace industry is not kits or things; it's it's uh, it's workforce development, a service called workforce development. And then finally, to redesign the SD's campus and, and launch an incremental uh, renewal and expansion program. So I'm going to spend a little time talking about each of those in, uh, in, in turn here. First is to make the company a, a, a self-supporting business again. Um, under Hobbyco, a lot of the basic back office functions had been stripped out and moved to Champaign, Illinois. And um, they all went away when SD's went away, or, or when Hobbyco went away. Uh, so we had to had to rebuild a number of functions, and you know, one of the, the first obvious thing we did was to get a catalog back out. They had discontinued the catalog, and uh, and and we spent most of that first year just getting the basic functions going. 2019 was the year of the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11, which was a big deal in the hobby, in the industry, and and. Uh, was a big part of our our focus uh, early on. In by 2020, of course, was the year of COVID, and and I'll talk a lot about the impact uh, on that on the on the hobby. Uh, and in, in 2021, that has continued the sort of second stage of COVID, both as the pandemic, but also as the impacts on the economy. And then as we move into 2022, we're all you know, realizing that this is not going to completely go away and we're going to have to adjust to this sort of hybrid world um, go, going forward. And that's the series of SD's catalogs there. You can kind of see the theme that we come at this from. Um, we found the catalog, you know, I came in thinking, oh, the catalog was an artifact of, of, of a previous generation, but it really is kind of the Sears wish book uh, uh, thing. And, and it, and it is, it is, Fundamental to Estes is identity, we've concluded. And so um, even though we're moving massively into the social media and into the online presence and, and upping that, uh, we still see the catalog as having a really important um, role in the identity of, of this. Um, and you can see in the new 2022 catalog, it's a throwback to the very first Estes color catalog from 1965 and 1966 with the uh, the venerable Mars Snooper back on there. But the the emphasis that we bring to this is clear that we see this as a STEM education, you know, inspiration, motivation, uh, you know, get kids interested in science, engineering, and the future, the impact it can have on their future, um, as opposed to a toy company. This is the team that is in place today. And, uh, 
And, and I, you know, I, I wouldn't normally just brief an org chart, but there's a couple of things I wanted to point to people's, uh, call to people's attention, because I think they're really important as we, as we go for, uh, forward. First is that uh, um, I actually have almost no role in this. Uh, I, I appreciate the, the opportunity to speak here, and, and I accepted it because I, I'm excited to do it. Um, but uh, Tripp and Vern and Fritz and I truly are advisors to the operation. The people on the ground really making it happen first is Mallory, Mallory Langford, who is trained as an engineer. And uh, uh, when she married into the family five years or so ago, I gave her a lifetime membership in the NAR, which I think at the time she probably thought was a joke. But uh, it, uh, it's, uh, things have evolved. She, uh, she actually left her, her job at uh, Bechtel Corporation uh, a year and a half ago and uh, is the full-time um, leader on, on, uh, on Estes today. And she's very capably supported by two rocket experts in this, Bill Stein and Ellis Langford, uh, both of whom have, both of whom grew up in the NAR and, and uh, are well known to everybody. Couple of key functions that we added that were not there. Um, uh, the functional stuff like HR, sales, and marketing that you would expect would be there, but had been stripped out. Um, but then also, very importantly, the director of education. We're going to talk a lot about education in a second, and Nicole Bear and her her role in this, and the director of quality and safety because um, that is really a, uh, one of the most surprising parts to me. Getting there was there was that position didn't exist at, at, at Estes. And, and in the world I come from, that is, that is just foundational. You have to have somebody uh, whose who's singular responsibility is, uh, is in that area. We've evolved the product line. I think uh, you guys are very familiar with that and Bill did a great job, I thought, last night uh, in the Manufacturers Forum. But just to briefly speak to it, you know, we serve a broad constituency of customers. Um, we have the starter sets and launch sets. We have the whole skill levels, which we've played with a little bit of what, what is the right way to handle those skill levels. We've tried to organize the new catalog more into that uh, skill level set. We've broadened and strengthened some specific product lines, this classics where, where you know, the, the, the original Estes, the K series is amazing. And you can tell just by how that has influenced the whole hobby. I mean. Um, in the manufacturers forum, well, there's a lot of product out there that is is based on the original SDs line, and that's because it's great. And part of our job is to create new new kits for Simrock uh, 20 years from now. Um, in in this, that that we want to both celebrate the classics, bring them back here at SDs, um, as at the same time create new ones. Um, we have this designer signature series that you've seen the first few of. This is one of Bill's really cool ideas, which is to celebrate designs that were done by the masters but never made it out into uh, into the product line. So you saw Vern's Orange Bullet and and Harry Zantar and 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 uh, and now Bill Simon's boss, and and that will continue. You'll continue to see that line, although we plan to broaden it into um, into more diverse stuff. That's not just going to be old white guy designs. We're going to be inviting uh, new faces into this, artists, um, uh, people who are, who are prominent in the community to, to, to design an Estes rocket. And we'll see how that, uh, how that works. But we think it's going to be really exciting. And, and you're going to see some, some really different stuff from some new faces as part of that signature series line. We have the Destination Mars and the Space Corps, which are sort of thematic lines um, built around uh, ongoing storylines. And then we have the one that I personally have been driving, which is the flying desktop models, right? That, that we're, then that's driven by going to the stores of lots of the companies or at the NASA gift centers or whatever. And you see these models that are very expensive and not very good models. Uh, I mean, I'm, my background is scale modeling, so I have pretty high standards on that. But the goal was for Estes to make a series of very well detailed um, uh, scale models that were worthy of display, but also could fly. And the first one was for the, for the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11, the Saturn V there. 
expanding the rocket motor line. You're seeing some of that. Um, and we're focusing on millimeter stuff. You're going to see a lot more on, uh, on that as that, uh, as that comes in, um, uh, in the, in the future here. And I um, encourage people to put questions into the Q and a part. I'll be looking at that, uh, eventually, but, uh, uh, We'll come back to some of this, but not in the chat part. The chat room is for for the discussion, I guess. But the the questions I'll turn to in a minute on the in the uh, in the uh, in the Q and A session. Um, so along the way, right? Uh, there have been a lot of of uh, it's been a lot of good surprises. There have been a lot of bad surprises too along the way. I want or or surprises. I, I wanted to just touch on on some of them uh, that, uh, that have played into this. Obviously the dominant one has been the pandemic, right? That has been a, a national, a, a world, a global health tragedy um, and, and continues. And, uh, and it's also impacted every aspect of, of our lives. Um, the the idea of how to operate safely and to learn to adapt to the pandemic we estes has put a lot into into that into staying open and in in and and to following the latest uh although always changing um health guidance um we have an 85 percent vaccination rate at estes in a in a state where it's or in at least counties where it's uh maybe a little more than half that is the average um, that's one of the vaccination buses you see in the picture here. Um, of course, the, the, uh, the, the other aspect of the pandemic was that everybody stayed home and they needed stuff to do. And so um, hobbies saw some resurgence, uh, renewed focus during the, during the lockdown periods. And, uh, you know, the education sales went away. A lot of the, when the big box stores were closed, that went away. But but the online stuff, uh, and, I, and I think you've heard that from other manufacturers too, um, uh, went through the roof and, and, and as people uh, stayed home and, and wanted stuff to do. This year's impact, of course, is the global supply chain meltdown, right? And this is just a chart of, from The Economist of, of container freight costs. And, uh, you know, they really have gone up by a factor of five or six. And, and I'm sure you all saw the price increase that Estes had to, had to push through um, at the end of last year. And this is the reason right here. I mean, there's some other contributing factors, but this is the big one right here is that is just an unbelievable uh, hammer that is applied to across the economy. You can see it. It's a big part of the inflation driver. It's a big part of the out of stock driver, but it, it, it has killed companies like, like us on the cash side. Um, Everybody's watched SpaceX, you know, they're, they're on their, uh, I don't know, what, what is Starship number 20 is on the pad or something like that. Um, and I think they demonstrate over and over that uh, this is a business where stuff doesn't work right the first time. And so we've lit up the night sky at Penrose a couple of times here as we've developed some of the things I'm going to talk about uh, the first time. Now, you know, what really matters is the second, third, A, doing it safely, right? Making sure that you can conduct tests safely and B, um, that you learn from them and fix it and make it work. Um, the next one was one I really didn't see coming, which is the biggest publicity event in the entire 70 years of Estes in terms of press coverage was our release of the Blue Origin uh, New Shepherd, which, um, was on all of the, all three uh, night nightly uh, uh, comedy shows, I guess. Uh, it was in uh, in a whole variety of newspapers and this, such distinguished press as the New York Post here. Uh, and Estes was front and center in it. And people have asked me, "Did you guys do that on purpose?" And and I've given the same answer that the president of Coca Cola gave when when uh, he was asked about the new Coke debacle and said, did you guys plan it that way? Um, and he said, number one, we're not that smart. And number two, we're not that stupid. <laughs> and so the answer is no, we priced it at where we did because that was where the whole line of, of these uh, ready to fly desktop models were. I think you might see them in the background. We've got three of them out now and more on the way. Um, and they were all priced the same thing. And we did get a call the night before, after months of planning, before we were gonna go live, 
from our partners in, up in Seattle who said, um, we're a little worried about the price. And we said, oh, don't worry, nobody's gonna, nobody would be that silly. Um, and we were wrong. And, and um, it got a ton of coverage. And the coverage on, you know, on Estes was generally very positive. Um, it, it certainly built the brand um, name recognition and, and people were all complimentary of Estes. That wasn't the, obviously wasn't the, uh, the target in that. It, it was an unplanned test of what does marketing do for sales, right? And uh, because you would never, I mean, we, we haven't finished the calculation of what it would have cost to buy that much um, uh, marketing coverage. But it was enormous. Um, I guess I would only say don't expect to see any Super Bowl commercials from Estes in the in the near term anytime soon. Um, so uh, that was that was an interesting experience to go through. And then the the latest really was uh, uh, our black powder supplier, uh, GoX, um, uh, suffered a, a plant accident last summer and um, announced it was closing uh, in in October. And I'll say more about what, how we've responded to that in a second. Um, but a, through a lot of this is is making is is the is rebuilding the process right that that we say rocketry is a hobby but Estes has to be a business and a big part of that is we're really proud of the fact that at the end of December um, Estes became what is to our knowledge the first in in this industry in the rock model rocket industry to be ISO nine thousand certified which is you know the world standard for for business uh, process control. It, Fundamentally, it's document your processes, say what you do, do what you say. Um, but it's a very rigorous and ongoing process of documenting that. And it's all built around, you know, making, uh, upping your quality and making your um, processes well documented and, and sustainable, right? And that's what, what we're doing. And we're, I'm very proud of the team there in Penrose who, who worked really hard through over the last year to uh, to pull this off and to earn that certification? It's not easy. The second big thrust is uh, is education, right? And I said that was the fundamental reason that we were interested in making sure nothing that Estes didn't go away. Um, the, our audacious goal is to have every student in America fly an Estes rocket by the time they graduate from high school, and we have an amazing team in place um, working on this. This is what I call, you know, part of the new, the new Estes. It's, it's, uh, it's headed by Nicole Bear, who I hope many of you have had a chance to meet. If you haven't, you, you will, if you're at all in the STEM side of it. Uh, Nicole is building a, a, an absolutely fantastic team here. And, you know, Estes has always been in the education and STEM business, whether it's been called that or not. Um, but our focus on it as an enterprise unto itself is is new and and very large and very significant. It's this data driven hands on learning experiences, um, reaching out not just to engineering but across the whole learning enterprise: art, music, digital marketing, you know, business. We think we reach today. One one of the things always is okay. So how do you know the impact you're having? Um, and, and we think today we touch about half a million students a year. And most of that, most of those estimates are based on, you know, what we see go out the door and, and, and we know where it goes and, and we follow, uh, follow that. And, uh, you know, we work with places like the AIAA's goal is to reach a, a million students a year. And if you were to reach that audacious goal of, uh, of every kid in America by the time they graduate, you'd have to hit about four million a year. Um, which is roughly the, the entering class each year in the K through 12 um, system. And so, you know, it's an audacious goal, but it's not, it's not completely crazy. And, and, uh, and, and it's something that we're actually pretty serious about. We're, the kinds of things we're doing is putting in place the foundations on that. You'll, you'll see a lot of new lesson plans that are being developed. And, and of course, the laws of physics haven't changed since Bob Cannon did this stuff um, in the 60s and, and 70s. But the way it's taught in the curriculum, the pedagogy of that has changed a lot. And it's important to fit into all of that if you want to be part of the educational system. Really excited about a program we have with the National Science Teaching Association. I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, and the School Ambassador Program is another thing that we've set up where we have, uh, you know, teachers who are 
uh, remain full-time teachers, but are, are specifically trained at and by SDs and, and specifically sort of the, the beta testers of a lot of these ideas and providing feedback in, into us. And then, of course, you, some of you may have seen the American Rocketry Challenge training series where we're trying to get more involved in, in TARC. Uh, the, our dream program has, you know, a formal part, the school-based part, an informal part, which is aimed at the sort of enrichment program things, and then a student-based thing, which is you know how most of us probably came into it as 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 individuals, um, with a lot of a lot of elements into into that program. Some of which we've started, some of which we haven't. I wanted to touch on two things we're really proud of. One is the Blue Origin partnership, which is far more than just a licensing deal to build models of Blue Origin rockets. Um, so that's an important part in itself, one we're really proud of. But that's only the scratching the surface. The Blue Origin has this uh, nonprofit uh, part of it called the Club for the Future. And the Club for the Future is very involved in education and STEM and lesson planning and, you know, things like reaching kids and they send postcards into space on the different uh, Blue Origin flights and and, uh, and, and driving a whole classroom program in that that works with Blue Origin engineers, gets them out into classrooms, as well as developing curricula. And we've developed a great part. The SD's rocket launch has become a part of the Blue Origin launch experience. Uh, if you, uh, if that picture in the top, it's a little hard to tell what that is, but at each Blue Origin launch now, they do launches of the SD's models uh, as part of that whole launch experience. And it's, and it's uh, um, you'll, that'll be a theme we're gonna come back to. Another big thing is Pocket Lab. This is an example of a, of a partnership that, that SDS has set up uh, with a company called Pocket Lab that makes a small data logger, which will fit in a BT-60 and is just an incredible um, device uh, designed for uh, you know, primary and secondary school students that does acceleration, has all the things of an inertial measurement unit in it, right? It measures acceleration in three axes, angular velocity, magnetic field, barometric pressure, altitude, it's got temperature, humidity, light intensity, all kinds of cool stuff, and very easy to program. It's a data logger, it has a Bluetooth data link, so you activate it from your phone, you download the data after it lands, um, and we've, working with Pocket Lab, have developed this Green Eggs classroom kit where you can fly the full data logger, you put it with the AstroCam, uh, you put it with an egg. I mean, you have the whole payload. Uh, just amazing what you can, can do with that. And they've been doing a whole series of, they call them unconferences. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson has been the, the, the keynote uh, and host at, at, at several of those. Estes is a big part of all of them. And, uh, and it's aimed, again, at teachers, uh, so 10,000 teachers annually in, in this. Um, another one we're really proud of is the National Science Teachers Association. And this is, this is a, an example, and I would say this to Andrew and to Jenna, it's, if you want to change organizations, it's important to change them from the inside. And this is both an example of leverage and internal change. Eric Pyle is a longtime uh, rocketeer. Uh, he is also a university uh, professor and teacher. He's currently the president, president of the National Science um, Teaching Association and uh, working with Eric at NISTA and uh, the AIAA Foundation, which I happen to be the, uh, uh, the current president of, um, we've put together a K through 12 rocketry curricular program that the AIAA Foundation is funding. NISTA is leading, ESTES is in a supporting role on that, and it will push curriculum out to all of the NISTA uh, teachers. And this is, this is, again, the way you reach millions of students is is leveraging through focused teacher programs and that's a huge part of what SDS is about right now okay part three was make SDS a rocket company again right to re strengthen our competency in the in the engineering and production of small solid rocket motors um, that's SDS energetics you may have heard about that you may have looked at their website um, the picture there is Carl Culling Carl is a name that's who's probably new to a lot of you um he uh uh he's um uh 
I, I, I've known him for a number of years uh, as a, when he was a student at MIT and then he worked at, at Aurora for a while and then worked at Bell Helicopter and, and joined Estes about a year ago to head up the launch of, of, uh, of, of a new function in, uh, in uh, called Estes Energetics. This is the 2350, the, uh, the motor that we just got certified. We actually developed this um, by uh, during 2020. So it, it actually, the development of this project predates uh, Carl um, Ellis and led this led this program at Estes during 2020, and it is an organically developed composite motor uh, in Penrose. You know, we get asked a lot: Is Estes going to make composite motors? And and the answer, the real answer is we don't know. I mean, we've looked at it from a lot of different angles, a lot of different possibilities. You know, it's pretty well covered from the hobby point of view by the manufacturers that, that you uh, you saw um, last night. And, and um, but Estes has, has been in the composite business before, but it's always been through some, um, either a licensing deal or there was somebody else doing it. It's, it hasn't really been an organic Estes development. And so in 2020, we launched a, a development program that was on the order of 100 times more powerful than anything we'd done before. We had a, an industrial customer that we did this for. Uh, we did on the order of, uh, of 100 of these. Um, we developed that we signed a deal with, with Purdue, uh, with a lab at Purdue. Uh, they helped us in the propellant development, um, and by the time we worked this thing through, um, we had developed uh, and delivered uh, and then certified um, high power motors. Now, what the future of this is, uh, of this particular motor, I'm not uh, not really prepared to say. We're not plan. Don't look for this in the next Estes catalog, but um, but Estes now has the capability indigenously to do composite motor development. The propellants, the all the testing, getting the EX numbers. We know how to do all of that now, which we didn't a couple of years ago, and uh, and and we'll see exactly where that where that leads us. Um, the first place it's led us is to the formation of this energetics company, um, which uh, is really aimed um, at filling the gap between the sort of hobby companies that this audience is very familiar with, and. Rocketdyne or Northrop Grumman, right? Which is a pretty big gap between those. Um, and you see a lot of new rocket companies, but but very few in the solid side. And uh, and there's a lot of applications in there. So Estes Energetics is focused on three things, the development and engineering of small and of, of custom solid rocket motors. We're not going to build, you know, SRM boosters for the for the SLS, but there's a lot of other new rockets out there. Um, R&D, uh, it'll be an R&D group. We, we've won contracts already from the Missile Defense Agency and, and others. And aerospace systems where we actually not only build the motors, um, but that we build, the, we wrap the systems around it. And, um, you know, more to come on that. But we're building the engineering team with the idea of the engineering, the professional engineering capabilities of a big company and the agility of a small company. And we split it out from... Uh, from the primary thing, because a lot of doing all of those things is not cheap. And by the time you put the overhead in place of software and engineering tools and the test equipment, it's no longer compatible with the, um, the extreme cost focus that you have to have for the STEM market. And so we've set it up. Um, also, the, the compliance standards are different um, in, the, in the, the government world. And so we've set it up as a sister company, it's co-located in, in Penrose, um, and you'll hear a lot more about it, but it is a, um, a sister company. And it will do a lot of the, you know, Estes will have the access it needs to any future propellant, uh, motor, whatever technology development um, through, through energetics. Another one of those surprise curveballs that's like you go, oh, I didn't see that coming. Um, so we're now in the black powder business. Uh, you know, we've been focusing on the supply chain. Um, <laughs> there's been a lot paid to the the, the shipping uh, delays and costs, but there's, you know, it's not as simple as oh, let's just make stuff all back in the U.S. The actual 
problem suppliers have been in the United States. Uh, we've seen, as it was mentioned last night, you know, uh, in the manufacturers forum, some of these people who make core things, elements of tubes or casings or all kinds of stuff, have changed hands. The, the scenario that we've seen is it gets bought by a private equity company and it stops being a family business. And so the, the people stop caring about it the, and the quality goes downhill. And it's uh, um, and then the black powder side was even worse where they had an accident and decided we're just shutting down. The insurance was, was too much to, to resume. So um, starting uh, a few months ago, we began to look into what we were going to do about that. And uh, on the 19th of January, uh, we became the proud owners of the <laughs> uh, of, of the black powder suppliers to the United States uh, since the Jefferson administration. <laughs> so the, this operation started in, uh, in 1802. DuPont uh, began, you know, producing black powder in 1802, I, shortly after the U.S. became a, a country. Um, they spun out GoEx in the 70s. They moved it to Louisiana in the 90s, uh, and uh, we bought it on January 19th, 2022. Um, and so we have a team deployed in Louisiana as we speak, uh, working to get the black powder production restarted. Uh, and then we're going to go from there. It's sort of the same thing as I told you about in Penrose, that you we're in the, in the stage of let's figure out what we're going to do. First, first, restore it to health, get it back on its feet then figure out a long-term plan for it. Um, it has obviously other markets besides just Estes, but Estes is, consumes a major part of GoEx's um, production, and which is, you know, it's not 5% of what their production was, which was why it was pretty viable for us to, to look seriously at this. So um, we're in the next stage of the turnaround. It For the moment, we're going to retain the GoX brand. It will. It is owned and operated as part of Estes Energetics. And stay tuned. We'll have more more news to come. Then the fourth area was sort of more integration into big aerospace, and this is one of my favorite pictures uh, up here. That is Margaret von Braun, um, who is uh, Bernard von Braun's uh, one of his two daughters. At the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11, at the gala dinner they held down in Huntsville to celebrate the, the successful flight, she's standing in an audience of, I don't know, hundreds of people in a gala dinner. She's the keynote speaker. She's standing underneath one of three remaining Saturn Vs that was led by her father, and she's holding in her hand an Estes Saturn V. And it's like, yeah, that just, that picture was why we did that model. Um, that uh, that that being able to 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 get a, a, a photograph like that and to get to push these things out um, is is part of how rocketry builds on and expands its ties in what I call the sort of professional aerospace side. the The big example of success so far here is is Tark, right? Trip uh, talked about that uh, earlier today in his. Uh, in his uh, session on how to win TARC. Um, many of the people in this session have volunteered at TARC. It's an all NAR enterprise, um, obviously uh, trips baby on this, but, but everybody helps, totally amazing. You and I all see it from the hobby side, but the other side of it, which Trip often alludes to, but then moves on very quickly is the AIA, the aerospace industry. And why did they do this, right? These are the this is the money behind TARC, um, and the reason that all of these companies put a couple hundred thousand dollars every year into TARC is for those words I talked about earlier: workforce development. They see this as a critical part of their strategy of how you excite, motivate, train, prepare the next generation of engineers and engineering leadership in this in this country. This is not a new idea. This is something that's been going on for a long time. That's Harry Stein in the 1960s briefing the AIAA, the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, which had just become the AIAA. It had been the American Rocket Society before that and the Institute for Aeronautical Sciences. So that's 
That's Harry Stein uh, trying to convince the AIAA that it should have a major part in model rocketry. And going back to my earlier point about having Eric Pyle, a rocketeer in charge of NISTA has, is how we've cracked the code with NISTA. Same thing with the AIAA. I, had, I became the president of the AIAA and the AIAA has taken a much stronger interest in, in space modeling, model rocketry since then. This is a picture uh, at the NASA 60th anniversary. And that is a lineup of every living NASA administrator um, as part of a panel there um, that is talking about space, the future, and the future workforce. And, uh, and, and the uh, model rocketry plays a big part of that in these, in these partnerships. We talked about AI, the AIA and TARC. We talked about AIAA and NISTA, although let me just say it's a virtuous cycle, right? How did the AIAA get the money to fund NISTA? It got it from Blue Origin, right? Blue Origin charged passengers. There was a famous $28 million ticket sale. Blue Origin gave that money to their nonprofit, Club for the Future. Club for the Future gave it out in $21 million grants. The AIAA Foundation was one of the 20 recipients of that million dollars. The AIAA Foundation would then use some of that to fund uh, NISTA. Uh, in the curriculum development for model rocketry. And they're using another piece of it in a program you're gonna be hearing about shortly called Students to Launch, which is a program that NASA came to the AIAA asking, saying, we wanna get more kids to come to see launches. And we particularly want a more diverse audience of kids exposed to how cool big launches are. This is the, uh, and, and the AIAA has taken the leadership and is as kicking in serious money um, into this program with NASA, which will take hundreds of kids a year to NASA launches, primarily at the Cape, but will also have a network of the schools, what they call community anchor programs around the country that will have vicarious participation in those launches. And every one of those will be based around the launch experience of building and flying model rockets, SD's model rockets, at each of those schools. So that's another big part of how these sort of virtuous cycles of how these partnerships build and work work together. The the, the bottom picture is uh, is is actually one of the launches at, as as part of a Blue Origin uh, launch day experience. And then my <laughs> one of my the favorite selfies of all times is Bob Benkin you know, an astronaut before he launched on the first uh, manned dragon flight. What did the, what do astronauts now do the day before their launch to relax? They go out and they fly model rockets. They fly Estes model rockets. Um, that's just, that to me just says it all about how the hobby has, has progressed. Um, and uh, just for the modelers uh, in the audience, that photograph of the SLS, that's, that's a, one one hundredth SLS there, um, as we're getting ready for the first SLS launch, which uh, is going to be a big a big event, and 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 Estes is very focused on uh, being ready for for the for the upcoming SLS launch. Okay, the last thing I wanted to cover was redesigning the Estes campus, and again, this picture, you have to kind of stare at that picture a little bit. Um, that is the original architectural model for the Estes headquarters building, sitting on a brick wall by one of the original um, Estes buildings that, uh, that I, I think that that may be one of the ones that Vern moved from, uh, um, from Denver. But uh, that's the original model. And, uh, and that was part of the archives at Estes. We'll talk about archives again in a minute. This is very blue sky, right? This is, this is <laughs> we're, we're still in the fixing the roof stage on a lot of, of these projects, but we're also looking ahead, right? Into what does it look like uh, in the future? And we want to modernize the, the employee experience, right? Make it a better place to, to work, um, improve the R&D facilities, preserving the historical parts of it, adding a public facing space, right? Previous, some recent owners didn't really want the public to show up in Penrose. Um, 
uh, we do. We want to make it a, a, a place that people can participate, come see how it's done, buy stuff, launch stuff. Um, I love the pilgrimage thing in there. That's really the most accurate for what I was there uh, in 1968, was on a pilgrimage to, to Estes. Creating an Estes launch experience. We've been watching all these launch experiences on like Blue Origin, and it's like, we can do that. <laughs> so, I mean, we can't do the big rocket where you get in and ride, but um, but we can do everything else on that and and at a much, much lower cost than $28 million a seat. So um, we're looking at, at a lot of things on that and then making it a, you know, a 21st century um, uh, icon the way the original building was in the, in the 60s. My list is very similar. I, I um, I want us to have a museum, right? I, I We have a lot of historical stuff there. Uh, I love the Museum of Flight. I love the NARS support of that, but I don't think the Museum of Flight should have a total exclusive monopoly on this. And I, and uh, one of our goals is to evolve uh, uh, a good, you know, hobby of model rocketry museum. There needs to be a book. Some of you have heard me working on this campaign. We don't have that yet, but we're talking with various authors. Um, Vern's working on one. Um, we need to have this, this, uh, the story of, of, uh, of, of Estes and the story of the hobby. You know, the Large Danger LDRS book uh, is fabulous, just a fabulous book, it, but it's all on the high power end of the hobby. We need the version of that on the development of the, of the, uh, of the hobby of model rocketry the store, the national launch site, a teacher training center, the Estes experience launch sessions. And then, you know, for what, looking at a lot of us in this, in this meeting, well, you know, maybe we should have an old Rocketeers retirement home. Then you, then everybody could, uh, could, uh, could be there. I, I, I said this in, in jest, you know, that's my view is on the left. Mallory's view is on the right of what that, uh, what that might look like, but, uh, but, you know, let your mind run, run free on what, uh, what, what, what could happen. We do have 300 acres there. So, uh, Bob Caplow be thinking. So, um, is in wrapping up here, uh, I want to just cover our vision, which we spent a lot of time on it's ignite the imagination, right? That's what it's about. Igniting the imagination of every generation by being the most trusted source for model rocketry, the mission, the mission statement is creating safe, successful rocketry experience for experiences for customers everywhere, from their backyards and their schoolyards to worlds beyond. The values that we hold fundamental in this first is safety. Uh, the second is the integrity of data. This is a data-driven enterprise in every respect. A sense of urgency and a bias towards action. The idea that Ideas come from everybody, and we we welcome um, ideas um, from everybody in this in this enterprise. Leading by example, um, you know, instilling personal accountability. If you've gotten an order recently, your orders now from SDs are signed, right? There's a card by the person who who packed it, and just little things. People take a little bit more ownership in their work when the, when you sign your work. It's true of all of us. Um, and then treating everybody with, uh, with, with dignity and, and respect. And ultimately, as Howard Galloway said, model rocketry is fun. And when we lose that, that view of it, we've, we've lost so much. That's our five-year plan we've been talking about. I want to just close on thinking about beyond. And we're, you know, we're looking at what does Estes look like at its centennial when Estes hits 100 in, in, uh, in 2058? And that's, that's definitely... Um, the goal of the enterprise. I, I doubt I'll be around to be part of that, but there's a lot of people on that org chart that I showed you that will be. And, um, and, and, you know, one of the biggest surprises to me, I guess it shouldn't be a surprise, but it still is, is the power of the Estes brand. And, and everyone in our family, Barbara, me, uh, you know, we go to doc from doctor's offices to people who work in, uh, in the White House Science Office, once they find out you're doing, you're part of Estes now, they all have, they say two things. First, they tell you their Estes origin story, the launch, the it, 
you know, blew up or it got stuck in a tree or their brother broke their arm or whatever. Um, and the, I didn't know you, that company was still in business. Um, but the power of the brand is, is amazing. Uh, and, and I knew it was strong. I did not know it was as strong as I now appreciate that it is. And so being a trustee of that is, is very important. Second is this building diversity and scientific literacy, right? We don't expect every kid in America to become a model rocketeer as a hobby or an engineer as a profession. But scientific literacy is important to our society and you see that every day, right? Whether it's the bridge that fell in yesterday in Pittsburgh, whether it's dealing with data in a pandemic, whether it's how you count votes in an election where you're measuring, you know, you know, as accurately as you can, you know, doing doing measurements of, of large numbers with a lot of different measurement techniques. It's really important that people understand the process, the numbers, what the science me scientific method really means, and that people get excited um, excited about it. And and I'll point to two ex examples of that. One is Silvia Acevedo, who is uh, who grew up as a as a young Latino in in New Mexico. Um, you know who. Uh, struggled in many ways and wrote a marvelous book about her path from uh, from from a, a, a child in New Mexico to uh, a position as one of the preeminent technologists and educators in the in the uh, country. Uh, she just stepped down as the leader of the Girl Scouts. She and she cites in her book two really pivotal organizations. The first was the Girl Scouts. And the second is by name, Estes Model Rockets. There are several pages in her book about Estes Model Rockets and how transformational they were to her as an experience because they showed that she could do things that nobody else, no one around her believed she could do, right? That how, you could become a rocket scientist. There, It's like what Jenna was saying last night, you have to have people that look like you to make you believe you can do something often and she had none of those models but the girl scouts and the estes model rockets making it accessible were um were pivotal in her career um another the other favorite story and and we you know we're collecting these of these estes origin stories right but is is woody hoberg who is uh an astronaut today uh he's a he's a friend i i i met him as when he was a student at mit he got selected into the uh, um the not the one that just got selected but the previous class of astronauts and he got named last year to one of the artemis crews which means he'll be headed to the moon if that program stays on track he was on wait wait don't tell me recently which shows he's really made it you know it's, a, it's one thing to get named to a moon mission but when you when you're on wait wait don't tell me you know you've you've made it um and anytime you listen to woody woody talks about how estes model rockets were a pivotal part of his early entry into the engineering process and sylvia and woody and there are countless others like them but they show the power of what Vern and glita and harry created our third big thing is expanding places to launch, right? I mean, like if you say, what am I really most worried about? It's we're like, um, like any, like, like an owl or a bird species, you know, our habitat is decreasing, right? The number of places that, that people can go to launch a model rocket today are much smaller than, than they were when, you know, I got my NARC card back in, in 1969. Part of that is as the climate changes, and the fire hazard increases, it's more and more serious. The, the fire restrictions are, are a no kidding um, uh, problem for the, for the hobby. Uh, but it's, it's not just that, uh, but expanding the, the places to launch is, 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 a, is a serious um, challenge for uh, all of us, for the NAR, for everybody here. And then again, sort of closing with an audacious goal, a first Estes launch on another planet. And again, the first SD's rocketeers to, you know, the next the next class of, of astronauts to walk on the moon will have SD's rocketeers among them. They they will have started 
on model rockets. Um, you know, the Apollo crews all started in the 30s on model airplanes. The, the, the Artemis crews will have all started with flying Estes rockets. Um, and uh, I don't expect Woody Hoberg to carry an Estes model in his kit bag. But I remember if you look at the Ingenuity Mars helicopter flight uh, that, that has been so successful in this past year, it flew as a getaway special on a on you know I don't know the fourth or fifth rover the U.S. sent to, sent to Mars. Um, I had spent a lot of time trying to figure out it uh, and working on big Mars airplane missions. But the first time I heard about the idea of flying a Mars airplane as a getaway special was in a NARAM R and D report in the late 1990s. Um, now that <laughs> happened to be Ellis's R and D report. But the idea, his idea was don't do the whole mission. You'll never get that. Just build a tiny thing and, and fly it as a getaway um, special. And that's exactly the approach that ended up happening, that JPL took on the Mars Ingenuity helicopter. And so whether you have some rocket launch aspect or whether it's Estes Energetics helping to build the Mars ascent stage, um, you know, one of one of our really audacious goals is to fly Estes stuff on on another uh, another planet. And so with that, I am going to um, get off the stage here with just uh, one more round of thank yous. Um, first to to Vern, um, you know, one of the other things we did when we in April of 2018, we said, OK, um, one of the first things is there's going to be one reserved parking space um, put out front. And it's going to be there for as long as any of us are, are involved in running that place. And that's for Vern and Glita, um, because this is their legacy. We are caretakers of, uh, of what they what they started. And uh, all of us, it's, we're on the fourth generation now of that. And um, but but what an amazing, amazing uh, couple and an amazing story. Uh, th thank you, Vern. The others thank to all of you. I mean, this is the the team here at the audience here at uh, at Narcon. That you know, Vern didn't do this by himself. It was it was all of the people uh, here and and lots of others um, who, who who were were part of this as well, um, because ultimately the hobby is all of the people who are in it, and we appreciate. Um, uh, uh, everybody, uh, you know, involved in Narcon, involved in the NAR, involved in the hobby. And, and I know, having been in the NAR for <laughs> since 1968, that, that some of the recent um, administrations at Estes did not view it quite that way. Uh, and I just wanted to say, so there's no confusion or mistake that that policy has changed and that, uh, that, that uh, we welcome with open arms um, the NAR and, uh, and everyone in the hobby. And we want to, um, uh, to hear from you. We want to hear ideas. What do you think we do right? What do you think we do wrong? What do you think we ought to introduce as products? How can we help you in this? Um, because, you know, this is the, the core of the hobby. And, and also how we can kind of help push you a little bit to, uh, to do the kinds of things Andrew and Jenna were talking about last night about how we build this for the, for the future and we all keep, keep paying forward. So with that, I am gonna stop talking and uh, see if there's any questions. So let me just uh, see if I can go back. And... All right. I have no idea what you guys are seeing at this point. But I am going to go to, let me just see if there's some Q&A. OK, I'm going to take this from the top. Um, and I think we were, I was told we had until till 10. So if anyone has the fortitude to go that long, I will, I will um, see what I can do here. Uh, do you see any likelihood of reshoring any of the model rocket kit manufacturing in Penrose? Well, we do some manufacturing in, in there now. The big kits are done there. So we already do some, some in, in Penrose. Um, we, uh, you know, it, <laughs> it's, uh, 
we'd love we would love we're looking at all kinds of things to be able to deliver um top quality product in a timely fashion um you know the um the i will say the the problem with uh uh having uh, the offshore production is not the quality or the cost um it, it's good stuff. I'm, we're we're really really happy with our supplier. It's the it's the getting here. It's the distance. It's the it used to be the suppliers, um, you know, that it was cheap to move stuff around, and it's not cheap anymore. Um, we would love to do more from sort of the let's let's create jobs in in America um, mentality. We're all for that. But I will also say that, um, as the other manufacturers saw last night, the the U.S. industry, it's it's more than let's let's just do it here. The, the U.S. industry has been hollowed out, and there's room for a lot of good rebuilding on the supply chain. And and I don't think you're going to see massive reshoring on anybody's part, um, given the cost pressures. Uh, and the quality of the supply chain. There needs to be serious effort put into rebuilding the U.S. supply chain base, and that's opportunity. Um, but it's 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 a complex um, problem. Uh, Bob Caplow asks, without GoX, would you've been able to make motors anymore? Well, uh, that was a good question. We we asked ourselves that um, <laughs> a lot. Um, the answer is yes, but we had to only, but not, but without domestic powder. We had, we, we immediately, as soon as we heard about GoX, we immediately um, checked our safety stock and then we increased our safety stock. So we placed big orders. The, it comes from Europe. It, you can't ship it into the U.S. It has to be shipped into Canada and then trucked here. Um, and to the other question of, you know, U.S. supply chain. The, I think the first thing for keeping the U.S. supply chain is don't have any more degradation in the U.S. supply chain. So there were there were possibilities. Yes, uh, it would have been more expensive and it would still be fragile, subject to supply chain interruptions. It had some real vulnerabilities. So um, we we think that you know we're we're very focused on on the cost of this stuff. I know. <laughs> I know from the buying point of view, it looks like oh, it, co it costs a fortune, and it does. I, but believe me, now that we're inside seeing all the numbers, um, you have to work really, really hard to keep keep the price down. And 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 domestic black powder is definitely part of that. Are we going to require that GoX black powder manufacturing operations relocate to uh, to Penrose? No, we're not. Um, we uh, we haven't decided yet about whether we move anything in either direction, but there's actually some technical reasons that black powder probably doesn't want to be manufactured in the low humidity environment of uh, 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 of the, the altitude Penrose is. So the Louisiana location is is there's some re several reasons why they make it there now, and our short term plan, which at the moment is our long term plan, is to keep it there. Um, any chance we can pre-order the super orbital transport and use the coupon included in the 2022 catalog? That's a really good question. Um, I'll kick it to, to Mallory uh, and Bill for the answer. But the problem on that is new laws. The big problem is new laws that um, you can't hold people's money for more than a certain period of time. I don't know what it is, 60 days or something. But the reason that you go on the SD's website and you can't order it you often can't order something even though you, it's back ordered, right? We're gonna, it used to be you just ordered it and then they told you it was out of stock. Now we at least tell you it's out of stock. Um, I still don't understand why we can't take the orders uh, for stuff, but it's, if we can't ship it within a certain number of days, we're not allowed to take people's uh, money, which is the way the orders work. And so, um, there's legal reasons that, that we that we're doing that. I'm not totally convinced we can't do a little better on that, but that's the reason you can't we can't take a pre-order uh, and take your money um, on that. We did do some on the on the uh, the Blue Origin, and so mm, we we will definitely look at the at the 
superorbital transport, particularly when it gets close. I think it's when it gets within a, a certain window of when we know we're going to be able to deliver it to you, then we'll uh, then we can start taking the pre-orders. Will we allow GoX to sell BP to other hobby rocket manufacturers uh, from Gary? Uh, our plan is to sell <laughs> to anyone we can legally <laughs> sell to <laughs> once we once we get that. You know, right now it's not. It's uh, we gotta we gotta rebuild a Corning press and and oh, here's Mallory saying Estes does internships. Okay, so that must be a question that I had missed. But uh, yes, Estes does internships, and um, we've had great experience uh, with interns, and we um, welcome welcome more. How about a special code for V Narcon attendees? Uh, I don't know. I'll, I'll kick that to to, uh, <laughs> to to Mallory, and Mallory will type something in the chat about uh, Mallory and Bill will type something in the chat about that. That's uh, that's above my pay grade. All right, I did the black powder question. Do you envision college? Uh, oh, Mallory, no pre-orders on the orbital transport at this time, probably for the reason I just told you. Will three D printing technologies be part of SD's future production? Uh, well, you know, we're still sorting out. 3D production stuff. Um, I really liked hearing what uh, Mike Nowak was talking about on the escape towers uh, uh, earlier, was it today or yesterday? Um, because I think we all have that problem of one flight and it, and it breaks. Um, 3D printing is clearly coming in in a lot of ways. Um, I don't know. SDs can't sell $500 scale models though. So um, I. We'll see. I mean, you know, we're focused on things that are really in the mass production um, stuff because that's what you got to do to get the cost down. And, and we're focused on, I know $69 may seem not very affordable, but when you're selling, but it, believe me, it's, we work hard to get the prices down to, to that. Do we envision college internships? Yes, we do those today. We're, we're looking to do more. Um, hi, Joe. Good to Good to see you. Thank you for your comment there. Where can teachers get a hold of the lesson plans? Um, Mallory, can you drop the uh, SD's, SD's education um, uh, link? Uh, either Nicole or, or Mallory can, can put that in there, but it's, um, um, I, I, that was something I meant to add to the, to the chart was the exact email. There is a separate education uh, website but you can get to it through the main SD's, um, SD's website. If I was more comfortable with this, I'd go pull it up right now. But those lesson plans are accessible through the current SD's, SD's website, actually. Um, you've been developing SpaceX models. This is Robert Bob Alway. Any chance the scale data can make its way to Peter Alway? Oh, you're, yes, I will. I can't just send it to you directly. I, I would say one of the things that SDS is very focused on and which there, I have two suggestions of, of seminars to add to next Narcon. One would be the, uh, you know, Andrew and Jenna got a question last night about what, what are the things that we do, we the current community do that discourage new participants? That would make a great seminar, a great session at an archon right by itself because uh, i certainly have some strong opinions on things that we we all do um, in that the other is sort of ip uh, protection and respect and how the ip world really works um i'd love to see one of those sort of ip for you know what the what the how ip really works um the uh IP, so that's long with saying we're we have licensing deals that that are in place with spacex and uh and uh Blue Origin and others, um, and we have to respect those. But um, we love uh, everything you guys do. We are big supporters. I'd love to distribute the book. Um, I'd love to have the book in print. I'd love to have the book have this the space grant in it. <laughs> that just a little plug that 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 Peter has had the space grant drawings for a while, and we'd love to uh, love to see that uh, come through in one of those. Um, and we have our own favorites too of, of stuff. I'm, you know, I'm really pushing for a Black Grant 12 is my, my favorite. I, I love Javelins, but it's time for Black Grant 12. So uh, plans for Pro Series 2. I think I just answered that question. I was hoping for a new rocket or two in the new catalog. 
Uh, me too, but you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. Uh, let's hear about ideas. I mean, um, uh, you know, I have to say, I was never a giant Red Max fan until I started going out with kids again and educating, you know, doing student launches and they love those. Those are great. And so does, oh, well, and now I do too. <laughs> it's like, it's like actually, you know, it's the walk a, walk a mile in my shoe kind of a thing that the world looks really different when you're actually doing it. And so tell us what else you'd like to see in that, in that line. Um, you know, my, my goal is a black rant 12. You, you tell us uh, we we need to sell more than one of uh, of stuff to make it to make it worthwhile. Back in Bob Cohn, hi Bob. Back in the '60s, SDS produced Model Rocket News. Oh yeah, any plans to bring something like that back? Maybe some SDS club membership. I would love to do. That. I would love for the SDS website to become sort of all things rocketry um, focused, and uh, um, obviously. You know, we've kept the catalog, but we're also going heavily and more heavily into social media. Um, a lot of old stuff is on the SD's website. A lot of the old technical notes are there. I would love to get all of the old Model Rocket news on there. I would love to have a modernized version of Model Rocket news, um, but that's probably several items deep in the queue um, to do that. What you have started to see is there's more sort of product of like, you know, really cool t-shirts or hats or water bottles or, um, you know, swag type type stuff. Uh, you're gonna see more of that, more of sort of lifestyle kinds of, of stuff, um, including in little kid sizes. Uh, uh, that's, that's our first step in sort of broadening um, some, of, some of that. Um, let me see, uh, sorry, these, these things keep moving here. I have a lot of 2020 catalogs, only one 2021. Are you able to hand out all of your 21? Oh, are there any 2021 catalogs left? Uh, I don't know. Mallory and Bill, we probably have boxes of them, don't, don't you think? Uh, we'll see if Mallory, maybe Mallory can drop something on that into the into the chat any plan to add competition rockets for na nrc and fai flyers uh well at the moment you know i we think that that other other players um you know galactic i think was what mike was calling his and um uh, they're doing a, a nice job on some of that i we appreciate that I think, as Bill sort of alluded to last night, we're looking seriously at, you know, what's the future of sub 13 millimeter engines? Um, and what would we do about that? If we made a play into that, uh, I, I think our, our play would be um, engine production. Um, we're gonna see how this 13 millimeter thing at the 2023 World Champs plays out. We love the engine box. We love the fact that <laughs> we're the, uh, uh, the, the U.S. companies, us and Aerotech, are the engine suppliers. We'll see how the other countries feel about that after it's over. If we would love for that to con continue in future, and and um, you know, most of the European suppliers operate sort of below the radar, regulatory radar, which we don't do. Um, and we're looking at at uh, at uh, we're we're looking at the engine side of that. Old Rocketeers home. Every unit will need a room to store rockets. Absolutely, there are positions that could it would have a fabulous shop. Um, is the one one hundredth SLS an upcoming kit? Uh, I wish I knew how to put a poll out. There is a poll up there. I, I'll say maybe. Can I add a poll? How many people would buy that one one hundred? I'm adding the poll right now. How many people would buy a 1100 SLS if we produced it? And assume it costs the same as the Saturn Vibes. Okay. Uh, single choice, multiple choice. Oh, I think it's just here. Answer. 
I'm just going to, I'm trying that. Please add an answer before creating the poll. Well, this is not good. I shouldn't be doing this in, in, in real time. Um, oh, well. Okay, all right, I just put out a poll, so answer those. Um, update to the Handbook of Model Rocketry. I certainly hope so. That's another thing. I think we sell that, and uh, I think that Bill is super busy. I'm, I'm certain that Bill is super busy right this minute, um, um, and we'll add that to the... But, but yes, we want to see the handbook updated, and we want to see the story of, you know... Vernon Glita's kids, uh, writ large. Uh, everybody on this call is in that category. Um, that's the, there's several books we'd like to see, along with an updated, and I mean, uh, Rockets of the World, um, to the always. Uh, subscription for cheap or zero cost shipping a la Prime. Shipping holds me back from spending. We have talked a ton about shipping at, at, at Estes, and I have been a giant proponent of pushing for for uh, for free shipping. Um, we have it at like 50 bucks or something right right now. Um, it's uh, I love that suggestion of a prime type thing, a subscription, an Estes subscription thing. That, that would be another good thing and that we'd love to hear about because if there's a market for that, we could do that. We work on adjusting regulations so that black powder in small quantities are legal available to rocketeers versus antique firearm owners. Yes. Oh, there's the new poll. Great. All right. Well. Um, yes, that is definitely on our radar screen. We've noticed that discrepancy, and we're. It's one of many things we've learned about in the last few months, and more to come. Uh, yeah, I'd love to figure out how to do that and um, have some ideas. Congratulations on the ISO cert. Um, chance of prices decreasing if supply chain issues resolve. Um, yeah, you know, we thought about putting that out as a surcharge, right? Basically as a, uh, um, here's this, and when this thing gets resolved, it'll it'll go away. Um, I'm... I'm not going to make any commitments to to that because there are obviously other costs in that. I think that goes to the question that a lot of people in Washington worry about is like, so what is inflation going to be um, a year from now? And how much of the current inflation is driven by shipping, which is a big deal, trans specific shipping, and how much is other stuff? So I'd say stay tuned on that. We see a Mike Dorfler signature series model uh, that Almost certainly, I can't tell you which which one it's going to be, but but clearly Mike is an absolute classic, a hero of many of ours, and somebody who would be very very uh, worthy of having a signature thing in there. Who are your primary distributors now? Meaning those that sell to Hobby Shop. Obviously, it's not Great Plains Hobby Co. Laughing out loud as Horizon back. Are they still headstrong RC only? Ah, uh, there's some things I'm not going to say, Chad. <laughs> so, um, are you planning to come out with a spaceship starship model? Yes. The answer to that. I mean, the short answer, as Bill said last night, is we're going to do whatever SpaceX wants to do because, um, you know, they're calling the shots and. Uh, it's funny, 10 years ago, they called Estes for their, when they did their first model. You know, there was a, drag, a, a Falcon model before. And apparently the previous Estes administration told them they weren't interested. And that was just another one of those things that when we got in there, we said, you did what? <laughs> you know, what did you say? And when we called SpaceX and said, hey, we're ready to, eager to make stuff for you. They said, well, we called you 10 years ago and you told us no. And it's like, it's one of many times, and I'll say it again, that things in Penrose today are different than they were in the past. So if you got an answer that didn't make sense or you didn't like um, 10 years ago, call again. 
because um, we're trying to do things differently. Um, I don't know how this works to get cut off. I guess I, the session ends in 10, 9, 8 seconds or something. I'm interested in core burner motors. Yep, well, we're Bill showed you the E60 that we're working on. Um, and, uh, and they ripped the fence off the first few models we put them in. Um, how about 13 millimeter mini Bs? That goes to the propellant formulation, right? That, that to get into the, the casing, we need a, uh, a higher impulse propellant than what's currently. Our current propellant is, is focused on cost. Safety first, cost second. Um, Let's see, what else have we got in there? Virtual hugs. Thank you. <laughs> we, we, we appreciate that. It would be great to get back to where we can do real hugs. Um, that's the thing I think so. Uh, yep, boat packs for school, definitely. Hey, Bill, Roy Green. Uh, Doing your due diligence before buying what surprised you, most disappointed you, or pleased you about what you found? Wow, that is a really, really great question. Um, well, in the due diligence before buying, what most surprised us was that Hobbyco was in big trouble. We, we, when we first went in there on the negotiation starting in the summer of 2017, we didn't know they were in trouble. It was only after we left and we were Googling on the way home, we said, you know, some of the things that they acted like, I wonder if they're in financial trouble. And we Googled Abiko and we found out they had stopped making payments to their ESOP plan or something six months ago. And we said, oh yeah, they're in trouble. Um, and that was nine months before the bankruptcy. That was clearly the biggest surprise on the bad side. The good side was, you know, the people, the workforce, the incredible dedication that that, that team had that stuck with it through real abusive situations um, and people lost, everybody lost in the hobby cove meltdown, but the team in Penrose, they stuck it through and stuck it out. And they are, they're an awesome, awesome group. I think that's the, the, all, all of them, the, the good, the good surprise. Um, okay. Any plans for composite motors from SDs? I thought I talked about that. Um, we're bit, we, we now know how to do it. Um, whether we will do it or not is a different, uh, or whether we do it for the hobby market, I would say, is the, is the question. Um, Pocket Lab availability. Will Pocket Lab be available to consumers? I think it is available to consumers. I'm, I don't know if Nicole is on, but I, I bought mine. Um, I, I want to make it available you know, more through as an SD's product, but, but I think you can buy it today from pocket lab. I, um, I haven't looked, I, I, that's how I bought mine. I went on their website and I just ordered one. And now that was last year or so who knows if they still have the chips, but all right, let me see. Uh, will SD's be able to supply black powder for HPR deployment systems? Well, I will. And thanks for, thanks for your incredible, save last night on the uh on the, on the manufacturer's demo um sure <laughs> in a few months i'll be able to give you all the black powder you want <laughs> so um there's william cook who to me is always billy cook um thank you for posting that link and oh, wait What's in store for the 29 millimeters? More long burners. We love long burners. Yeah. Um, our, my goal on 29 millimeter right now is to is to keep the inventory and just to stop running out of them, which, um, you know, that's our first thing is keep them in stock or make enough that 24 millimeter mercury atlas. Uh, I think that's in the queue. That's happened. Uh, the, is it 20? Yes, the 
24 millimeter. I mean, we might make it 29 millimeters, but it's uh, um, the Atlas is that that won some previous poll that we did, and and we uh, are bringing back the Mercury Atlas. Yes, that is in the queue. That's actually happening. Seventy two forty, honest John, a maxi version. Yes, I personally think the of the maxi brutes, the one that I thought was safe <laughs> that flew well was the the original was the uh, honest John, and I think that is a perfect model for our twenty nine millimeter motors. Um, it is not in the queue yet, but it but. It, it seems like a really good, um, and as soon as I fly the one, as soon as I fly mine, I'll let you know. Um, but I, 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 that's a great candidate to me for a, for a kit, uh, for, a, for a pro series kit. Uh, the early space models, the Russian models too. Russian models are a great question. We have a lot of internal debate. Should we make an N1? I say yes. Everybody else says no one's ever heard of the N1. We wouldn't, we wouldn't sell any. So, um. 29 millimeters be available at Hobby Lobby? Um, that's a longer question. Uh, ask ask uh, Bill. I think that gets into some shh. I won't go any further. I, honestly, because I'm not the right person to answer that. SpaceX builders kits in the works. There's actually a lot of neat SpaceX stuff in the works. Um, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, the Peewee, wasn't that a Century model? Um, <laughs> how about a 1980s Athena? Uh, yeah, 1 to 14 scale Athena. That would be another cool one. Um, that, that, that's a pro series. Um, the pl classic man-rated U.S. rockets and keep 75 in production. Well, I'll put in a plug for Boyce Aerospace Hobbies, who I'm sorry to say was not at the manufacturer's forum last night, but is awesome. And um, I love the little 1 100th um, scale stuff that they have. I, I, I have all of them. I, I had to put the little redstone back in there just because it's it's so cool to me to see a redstone in comparison to a Saturn V of how big they really are. And you know, I've asked them to make me a little V2 to go in there. And, and when you see the, you know, the V2 and the Blue Origin, uh, the New Shepard are about the same size. And uh, uh, in pictures, it doesn't really come through until you have the models. B16s or B14s. B14s is a good question. Um, if there's a lot of demand. Do you hire 70 year old interns? We do not discriminate on the basis of age. So, um, you can apply. <laughs> Core motors be boosters. Uh, I don't honestly know the answer to that question. I don't see why not. We made B14 zeros. Uh, Spare parts. If you look on the website, there's a lot more spare parts than there used to be, and that will continue. I used to be able to buy any individual part from Estes, and uh, I'm not sure we'll go back to that. But I was, I do like the the increase in uh, in in uh, the, our website's focus on on adding more and more um, spare parts. NRC competition and narrow them through prizes. Um, Estes Education does a lot of uh, Estes does a lot of stuff, and and um, you know, reach out to to Bill on that. Uh, ULA models, huh? Well, if you watched closely, uh, there were some hints in the in the talk. The Maxi Honest John, perfect for the FSI. Hi, Bill again. Yeah, right, I think that's right. Although I think the F-15 would do okay on the Maxionis John, I really do. More reissues of the classic Centuri kits. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're unsure what the appetite for the reissues is, and we will continue and let us know which ones you want. Um, we periodically put out polls on social media. I don't know if I trust those all that much, but aspiring aerospace in today's 
aerospace industry. Oh, well, I definitely would do the, uh, that presentation today on the, on the, uh, the progress that they've made on the Spaceport America Cup. I would definitely be doing, <laughs> doing that if I was uh, younger. And we should do an Ariane 5 James Webb Space Telescope model. So um, hmm. I think that goes to the, should we make an Ariane 5 model? Um, obviously, I love Ariane's, particularly the four and, well, all of them, but um, that's, let's see. Okay, that I think is probably a good place to stop. We could have fun with the B-14-0. Yep, Jim Filler was the one who really convinced me of how great B-14-0s were. I mean, we, we did the first two launches of his bumper whack with B six zeros and then we put a B fourteen zero in and you could really tell the difference. I mean it was the went like four times higher on the first stage. All right. Um I think there's beer loft is next, so I'm I'm ready. Let's uh I'm I think we should wrap this up. Thank you everybody for your patience and um the low beer light is probably well on for everybody. Thanks for attending. Oh, I want to see what the poll is. How many would we buy? Oh, 47. Oh, that's not enough, guys. <laughs> so the answer is we're not starting production tomorrow for, oh, now it's 101. Oh, I don't know. 125, 150. Oh, that's getting there. That's getting there. You count all the ones that the SDS people themselves would buy. That's a, a that's a. We fly our own stuff, so it's it's funny. I hadn't built SDS models since like 1971, uh, and now I've built. Now I, I try hard to build everything that we that we come out with. I wouldn't say that I do, but I, I do a lot. All right, thank you everybody for listening. Thanks for your attention and your support and being part of this. Uh, this, this great endeavor we call space modeling or model rocketry and keep flying and keep paying forward. Thanks everybody. And good night.